Well, hello, and welcome to a special spring break edition of Dome at Home. This is also the spring break planetarium watch party for the planetarium show Invaders of Mars. It's spring break. It's usually with one of the busiest weeks of the year for us at the Manitoba Museum. And uh, this this year, most of the things are happening online. The museum is still open, but all of our planetarium stuff is uh, is all online. And so we've got a couple of things all happening at once. My name is Scott Young. I'm the planetarium astronomer here at the Manitoba Museum, and I'll be your host for today. With me floating in the background, the disembodied voice of Mike. He is around to uh, moderate comments. He's uh, over on Facebook and YouTube. Normally, we run a Zoom uh, webinar at the same time. That's not happening tonight, but that does happen for our, our uh, future shows. And so this is uh, the beginning of a new season of Dome at Home. We run every Thursday at 7 o'clock. It's a about an hour long astronomy show based on what's up in the sky, space news, cool space stuff, and all those kinds of things. Uh, so if you're here for the, the spring break program, consider dropping by next Thursday as well. We'll be around here. You out there, Mike? How you doing? Yeah, sorry, I'm here. I was just uh, busy on Facebook already. There are lots of people on there and uh, excited to get things uh, started. Excellent. Yeah, it's a it's an interesting uh, switch for us today. Like I say, we have uh, we have a special planetarium show as well as our our weekly dome at home show. As I mentioned, and if you've been following the show, you know that uh, our first season ran through March, and that was funded by the Province of Manitoba Stay at Home Grant. I'm really excited to announce that Steinbach Credit Union has come on as our lead sponsor for season two. And so that means we get to run all the way for the next three months or so running Dome at Home every Thursday night at seven o'clock central. So we'll be here um, for that time period. Thanks very much to them for stepping up and, and supporting this program that we know a lot of people really enjoy. We also have um, the links up. If you do want to watch the show uh, future episodes on Zoom, you can go to the Manitoba Museum website, uh, manitobamuseum.ca, click on the Dome at Home link, and that will take you to the registration page. And basically, you if you register, you're, you'll be registered for all of the April shows. We've, uh, we've found that that might cut down on the number of things you have to sign up for. So you can sign up for that, and that way you can watch on Zoom. That's the chat that I'm able to pay attention to while the show is going by. And of course, Mike answers questions there, as well as over on Facebook and YouTube. All right, let's get started. Our theme tonight is Mars, partly because of all the exciting stuff coming out of uh, the Martian rover that's up there right now, and also partly because uh, the planetarium show that we're going to be running is all about Mars. Let's pop over to the evening sky as viewed from oh, my mouse was giving a little problem there. This is the sky just after the show about eight o'clock. And if you go over towards the western sky, most of the winter constellations that we've been watching for the last little while are sort of setting over in that direction. We've got Orion the Hunter over here with his belt of three stars. We've got the V shape of Taurus the Bull that is right in uh, this area here. And then uh, up above we have this sort of pentagon of stars with the bright star Capella here. This is the constellation of Auriga, the charioteer. Right in the horns of Taurus the Bull is the planet Mars. It's faded quite a bit since what was visible um, several months ago. It's it's well past its prime. In fact, it's going around the far side of the sun, so it's actually getting quite far away from us right now. But you can see it with your unaided eye. You don't need any kind of uh, telescope or anything like that. It's a, a fairly bright star-like object, and you'll probably notice that it is kind of orangey-red color. Now, we're not talking about, you know, a laser pointer red. We're talking about a slightly orange tint. Colors in astronomy tend not to really jump out and, and hit you in the face. They're a little more subtle. Kind of similar to the um, tint that the red star Betelgeuse in Orion the Hunter has, this one over here. So you can actually, the, with them being at about the same height, it's a perfect time to compare the color and see which one's redder, whether it's Mars, whether it's Aldebaran down here, which is another red giant star, or whether it's Betelgeuse over there. So Mars is, as I said, going around the far side of the sun. And so what that means is for the next 
few weeks, it will be getting, um, it'll be moving this way relative to the stars, but all of the stars will appear to be moving down towards the horizon. Now, what's really happening is the Earth moving around the sun and, and so on. But, but from our point of view here on the Earth, basically what it means, Mars is going to be getting lower and lower each night, and it'll be harder to see. So this is time, kind of a perfect time to go out and catch it. It's already difficult to see anything with a telescope. If you're a telescope user, it's already so far away and so small that unless you have some pretty serious gear, you're not going to see much other than a little red dot. It's, it's amazing. About 220 million kilometers away, and uh, we just can't see very much detail at all. But still there and still kind of cool to see. And it has been the focus of so much attention over the last... 50, 60 years or so, starting in the 60s and then progressing through to today. And that's the theme of our program that we're going to be watching, which is called Invaders of Mars. Not from Mars, but of Mars, because Mars is the only planet in the solar system that we know of that is entirely populated by robots. Well, well, as far as we know, there are no other life forms that we've found yet, but we'll have to see what happens with some of these latest spacecraft. Our program today is uh, produced by Evans and Sutherland. They're, they're the folks that actually make the planetarium system, Digistar, that we use. And uh, it's a great show. It's about 25 minutes. See if you can catch who the narrator is. It's, he's a fairly famous uh, uh, doctor, or at least he plays one on television, or has in the past. And uh, just has a great voice for this kind of thing. Very, very serious, but also very entertaining. So we'll watch the program. I'll then come back and we will do questions and answers. If you have any questions, drop them into the chat. Mike is monitoring during the show, as well as uh, after the show, we'll do some, uh, some questions. And we'll also have a little bit of an update on what's happening on Mars, because this show doesn't take into account the, the very latest stuff, of course. So with that, let's sit back and relax. We'll enjoy the program together, and then we will come back at the end for Q&A. So I present to you... Invaders of Mars. After 10 months and traveling hundreds of millions of miles across the void of space, a robot spacecraft built on one planet lands on another. An interplanetary first. Science fact, not fiction. The date, July the 20th, 1976. The planet, Mars. To the Babylonians, it was Nergal, god of death and destruction. Its distinct red color signified blood and violence. In Norse mythology, it was Tyre, god of combat and heroic glory, after whom we named the day of the week called Tuesday. For thousands of years, this planet intrigued early sky watchers, and our fascination continues to this day. We call it after the name of the Roman god of war, Mars. Mars Hill, Flagstaff, Arizona. Observations made here would color our ideas of Mars for over half of the 20th century. Astronomer Percival Lowell built a giant telescope here specifically to study the red planet. He dedicated over 15 years of his life attempting to solve the mystery of its changing appearance. Before Lowell's observations, it was known that Mars was about 4,000 miles across, rotated once in just over 24 hours, and had a year almost two Earth years in duration. Intriguingly, it also appeared to have seasons. At its closest, it was a mere 35 million miles away. Gazing through his telescope, Lowell carefully studied the different views that Mars presented him from day to day and month to month. Of course, this was no easy task. Earth's atmosphere caused the image to constantly shimmer and weave around. It was quite a challenge for the human eye to spot such elusive surface details. 
Still, Lowell was not deterred. He painstakingly recorded fascinating scenes, polar caps that shrank and expanded, changing dark areas, and long lines that joined them all together. He was certain that he had observed lines of vegetation planted on the banks of giant canals. Canals that brought water from the poles to irrigate the planet's vast deserts. And that all of this was built by Martians. Until the 1960s, Many people actually believed that the Martian surface was crisscrossed by artificial canals built by intelligent Martian life forms. As our view of Mars improved, we began to see fewer and fewer lines. But even in the 1960s, our ability to see Mars from Earth was still very poor by today's standards. And so, mystery and imagination ruled. Imagine the surprise and disappointment when in July 1965, the Mariner 4 spacecraft flew past Mars and revealed a cold, lifeless world. As it sped past the planet, its primitive camera beamed to Earth scenes of a beautiful desolation. No canals, no cities, no vegetation, no Martians. Other sensors recorded freezing temperatures and an extremely thin atmosphere. An apparently dead world in a deep freeze. Six years later, Mariner 9 became the first artificial satellite of Mars. It arrived when Mars was totally obscured, hidden beneath a vast planet-wide dust storm. Four mysterious dark spots slowly emerged beneath the swirling clouds. These were the tops of giant volcanoes. When the dust cleared, it revealed a planet much more dynamic than expected. There were features formed by dark dust and strong winds, craters like mud splats, strange meandering features that looked like dried up riverbeds, and a vast canyon that spanned the surface. Mariner revealed an exotic planet with an interesting past and an even more exciting future for exploration. It's July 1976, and the first spacecraft lander from Earth sits atop the mysterious Martian surface. It's the most sophisticated space robot yet made. Within minutes, its scanning cameras slowly construct the first pictures from Mars. In black and white, they reveal a rather bleak, boulder-strewn surface with distinct hills and crater rims in the distance. A series of filters applied to this image provided the first color picture from Mars. It revealed an amber sky with dusty clouds high in the super-thin atmosphere. In color, it was a much more welcoming world. Six weeks later, Viking 2 landed 4,000 miles away on top of a small rock and almost tipped over. This landing site was nearly identical. Boulders covered with tiny holes, volcanic in origin, litter the surface. Both landers searched for traces of life in the soil, but all the results were disappointingly negative. The soil itself was mostly sandy silicon with lots of iron oxide, essentially rust which gives Mars its red color. 
the carbon dioxide atmosphere was found to be 100 times thinner than Earth's, but still thick enough for weather to occur. Each Viking spacecraft consisted of a lander and an orbiter. The electronic eyes of the orbiters allowed us for the first time to experience the planet's features in considerable detail. We are heading towards the rim of the canyon named after the Mariner spacecraft. Valles Marineris is over 4,800 kilometers long. It would span the entire United States or Australia and is nearly 10 kilometers deep and 120 kilometers across. The entire Grand Canyon of Arizona would easily be lost in just one of its tributaries. In fact, canyon is far too small a word to describe this chasm. It's more like a vast fracture on the planet's surface, like the Great Rift Valley in Africa or the San Andreas Fault. Here, the planet was torn apart by great stresses, probably emanating from the huge volcanic structure nearby, known as the Tharsis Ridge. Flying over the Tharsis Ridge, we look down on an immense volcanic bulge in the planet's surface. This dome of lava could cover all of Europe to the height of Mount Everest. It's here that we find four of the largest volcanoes ever discovered. The most striking of them all is Olympus Mons, the biggest, broadest, tallest volcano in the solar system so far. It is so big that if you were on its slope, you would scarcely be aware of the true size of this volcanic monstrosity. It has a vent at the top into which you could fit Los Angeles and still have room to spare. Most recent data suggests that these giant volcanoes may have been active just a few million years ago. The Viking orbiters also gave us our first close-ups of two tiny potato-shaped moons. Both skim relatively close to the Martian surface and are most likely captured asteroids. Both are regarded as good landing spots for future Mars exploration missions. Here is the largest, Phobos. This captured asteroid is about 22 kilometers across, with gravity so light that an average human would only weigh a couple of ounces. Phobos skims across Mars at an average height of just under 6,500 kilometers, its orbit spiraling ever closer to the planet. Its surface is dominated by craters, cracks, and fractures. They all emanate from Stickney, a massive crater about 10 kilometers across. However, this is nothing compared to the crater Phobos will make on Mars when it finally gets too close and crashes into the surface in just a hundred million years from now. Gently moving outward from Mars, 
is its other smaller moon, Deimos, only about 15 kilometers across. Its surface is extremely dark and very smooth. It seems to be covered in a deep layer of dust that fills many of its craters. Like our own moon, it keeps one face permanently turned towards the planet. It orbits Mars every 30 hours at a distance of about 24,000 kilometers. The Viking missions changed our view of Mars yet again. Then we understood it as a sterile world with a surface frozen in time for the last two and a half billion years. This was the accepted scientific opinion for the next 20 years. But in the late 1990s, a new era of Mars exploration began and continues to this day. From Earth, we launched an armada of landers, rovers and orbiters. Mars was invaded as never before. And the new data we found started to reveal even more of its deep secrets. 21 years after Viking, the Pathfinder mission reopened Martian surface exploration with Sojourner, the first roving vehicle that crept along at the dizzying speed of one centimeter per second. That's one kilometer in almost 12 days. This mission also carried a new strategy for Martian exploration. Follow the water. It was clear that water had flowed over large regions in the past. The European Space Agency's Mars Express typifies the spectacular capabilities and successes of the latest high-tech orbiters. High above Mars, it can probe deep below the soil and at the same time assess the qualities of the atmosphere. This Martian satellite provides a stream of images and data that continues to rewrite the textbooks on Mars. While the cameras relay their exquisite pictures, the other instruments have been conducting their own unique investigation. Traces of methane have been detected in the atmosphere, and this could indicate that volcanic activity or even primitive life forms exist today. Other data reveals landscapes hidden beneath the surface terrain. Radio waves have penetrated the bedrock to reveal traces of vast water ice deposits covering large areas of the planet. As yet, we have discovered no liquid water on the surface. This is not surprising, since the very thin atmosphere would cause it to quickly evaporate. However, there are major features across Mars that obviously have been sculpted by running or still water in the past. Evidence even points to sudden and sometimes catastrophic water flows. Abrupt melting of the underground ice, either by volcanic activity or meteorite strikes, could be the cause. We have very little on-site information about the poles. The ice here consists of layers of frozen water and carbon dioxide. Surface ice exists at the Martian poles. The amount varies according to the season, but over the years, ice and dust have built up in massive layers. Measurements show that at the southern pole, there is sufficient water ice to flood Mars to a depth of over 30 feet. Recent observations have discovered dark streaks on the polar ice. Some researchers believe these have been caused by gases venting through the frost-covered surface. Could they be carbon dioxide geysers firing dark dust into the air? We don't know for sure, but it is an intriguing idea. On May 25, 2008, the Phoenix spacecraft landed just at the edge of the Martian North Pole. It will be able to drill deep into the icy soils and carries a tiny laboratory to test for organic compounds. Images of its Arctic surroundings will be beamed back to Earth. 
If all goes well, it will have about three months of life before it is entombed in the carbon dioxide ice of the polar winter. Temperature here is 200 degrees below zero. Further south, especially during summer, the temperature can be quite balmy at 50 degrees. Although the atmosphere is 100 times thinner than on Earth, the temperature difference between the ground and the air generates dust devils. These pockets of warm, rising air begin to eddy and swirl like a whirlwind. They pick up dust and debris and can become quite spectacular. Their earthly counterparts never amount to much, but just imagine if a dust devil in the Sahara could trigger a thunderstorm massive enough to cover the whole Earth. That's what's believed to happen on Mars, where a huge storm can cover the planet from pole to pole. Dust devils thrust up so much material that they heat up the atmosphere. This creates powerful regional storms that can spread quickly across the entire planet hiding Mars under a dusty blanket. In 2007, such a planet-wide storm made scientists fear for the safety of the two robotic rovers then on the surface. Somehow, these heavily dust-covered robots just managed to survive. Named Spirit and Opportunity, they have traversed the surface since 2004. The images and data which they have sent back have helped us refine further the story of Mars and provide additional data for the more remote instruments on the orbiters. Their most exciting discovery was silica. Its presence suggests that hot water springs once existed. On Earth, such springs harbor primitive life, did they also on Mars? As we enter a new era of Mars exploration with ever more sophisticated spacecraft, Mars is as tantalizing, as mysterious, and as exciting as ever. We've seen just how much our views of the red planet have changed over the last 100 years. As we began our investigation of this intriguing red dot in the sky, we discovered its mysterious canals and lines of vegetation, which were so prominent to Percival Lowell. He watched those dark markings expand and contract as the Martian seasons changed, and to him, these were clear signs of some form of life. Lowell's dreams of Mars influenced a whole generation of observers and writers, Writers who, until the 1960s, populated the planet with fantastic cities and alien life forms. Could this ancient world really be home to other intelligent beings? It's a good question. What this planet provided was a focus for our imaginations, a new vision of a new world, a new frontier, a new destination for brave explorers. At first a stage for fantasies, then a focus of intense scientific endeavor and study. While the winged planes of the 1950s still belong to the realm of science fiction, in the realm of science fact, engineers and scientists are designing the spacecraft which will explore Mars in the near future. At first, there will be ever-increasingly sophisticated robots. But one day, before the 21st century is 50 years old, the first manned vehicle will touch down on the Red Planet. It's possible that some of us here, or our children, will help design and build this craft. Others will crew it. And one of you could be the first person to step out onto that lonely, dusty Red Plain. The invaders of Mars will be humans, 
How our invasion will end, no one knows. It will be a second small step onto an alien world, a step that will take humankind to an exciting new future in the cosmos. Right. Well, that brings us to the end of our presentation here. I hope you enjoyed Invaders of Mars. Definitely got some very cool stuff that has happened in the past on the planet Mars. And now we'll be looking forward to the more modern uh, era as well. As, as mentioned, the modern era of Mars is continuing to... Um, Sorry, uh, the modern era of Mars is continuing and we are continuing to explore Mars, not uh, just with the same old spacecraft, but with ones with new capabilities and some exciting things coming up here. We're just going to let these credits roll out as we uh, finish up the show, as we're legally required to do for things like this. Uh, it's great of Evanston Sutherland to let us um, broadcast these kinds of shows. Normally, when you license a planetarium show, you're allowed to show it in your theater, but putting it on the internet is, you know, a no-no. But they have been very supportive of planetariums during this COVID time. Many of the planetariums around the world have been closed for some period. And uh, it's really great to have uh, folks at, at ENS to uh, let us do some programming so that we can still reach our audience and stay in touch with people and, and things like that. So it's pretty, it's pretty great to be able to do this. We will be running other planetarium shows and we have in the past as well. And um, you'll be able to see more of the, of the uh, various planetarium sort of traditional planetarium shows offerings as, uh, as the year goes on. We hope before not too long, we'll be able to reopen the planetarium itself, but that of course, depends on the way things go so we'll we're all we know for sure we're going to be here every thursday night at seven o'clock for the next three months and uh, everything else we'll take it as it comes okay as uh, as mentioned we are going to do a little update to that show that show only went up to around 2010 or so and since then quite a bit of mars exploration has happened the red planet has actually uh it came to it came to its closest point to the Earth in 2003, and that there was sort of a whole bunch of uh, exploration around then. But it sort of continued every 26 months or so. The two planets, Earth and Mars, going around the Sun will line up so that they're sort of close together, and you have a a relatively brief trip. And so every 26 months or so, space agencies from around the world tend to launch spacecraft out to Mars. And so we've had a number of them go in um, pretty much every couple of years. Many orbiters are still there uh, from the last number of, of uh, launch attempts. Uh, right now there's still, well, there's seven active uh, spacecraft in orbit around Mars. Uh, the Mars Reconnaissance or Orbiter up there at the top with a really, really high resolution camera. Uh, MAVEN is, is studying the atmosphere of Mars by sort of looking through the atmosphere at the, at the sun and the stars behind it and, and measuring what that does to its light. The Trace Gas Orbiter is looking for all sorts of things like methane and uh, water vapor and those sorts of things. The European Mars Express uh, spacecraft is, is is still there, um, and Mars Odyssey, which was launched in I think I think that one was two thousand and one, and it's still there and functioning. Most of these spacecraft, their their science instruments aren't necessarily all working, but they are functioning as a radar or as a radio contact. So basically, the rover that's on the surface doesn't have a big enough antenna to easily beam everything all the way back to the Earth. That's a long distance. So what it does is it beams its images up to one of these satellites and that relays it to the Earth. That sort of frees up the, the computing power on the rover. So there's sort of this constellation of satellites for communications around Mars already. These are some of the spots that we've uh, landed various spacecraft. In, in 2012, we had Curiosity, which landed down on the uh, right-hand side there, sort of in the middle of the screen. 
And then just uh, in February, we had Perseverance. That's the sort of highlighted one there. There are a couple that aren't on this list. Um, some of the early Soviet Mars probes actually did reach Mars. One of them lasted uh, for about 20 seconds before something went wrong and the, the radio sh shut down. But the, the probe actually probably did everything it was supposed to do, just wasn't able to tell anybody on Earth. And that was back in 1967 or something like that. Um, and similarly, uh, there have been a couple of, of others. Uh, the Beagle lander was supposed to land uh, from the European Union and it, uh, it landed, but it did not survive the landing. Um, that's, that's why we use robots for these kinds of things, first of all. There's, uh, with these high-res cameras, we can actually look for the wreckage of some of the old spacecraft on Mars. Recently, they found what they think is the old Soviet Mars 3 lander which was uh, you know, basically gonna land and it had some robot arms and it had a tiny little rover, not a, not a wheeled rover, but it sort of like was like a, a sled kind of thing that would sort of pull itself forward. Like those really um, cheap robots you used to be able to get in the stores that would just sort of pull themselves forward with each little um, motion of an arm. Anyway, that's kind of cool that we can actually see things of that kind of detail. You're not going to be able to read this, but this just gives you a sense of the scale. These are all the spacecraft that have flown to Mars uh, in all of human history. The, the surrounding ones are orbiters. The ones on the planet are um, landers. About half of these worked. Only about half. Now, some of that is because in the early days of spacecraft, rockets would tend to blow up and you would have a whole bunch of other things. But also... Going to another planet is hard. I mean, you, you have to get going really fast to get away from Earth, but then you have to slow down at a, and, and not slow down too fast by like crashing into the planet. So very, very complicated kind of mission. This is Curiosity, um, right up there for one of the, one of the best uh, Mars rovers in existence. It's still, uh, it's still up there, still taking pictures and doing things. It, it was in 2012. Uh, and it basically, it's about the size of a small car. It has a big uh, arm on the front with a bunch of um, cameras and science instruments. And then a, uh, that white rectangle there, that's another set of cameras, high resolution cameras and uh, navigation cameras and things like that. And so it sort of became famous by taking selfies of itself. And so because it's got cameras on its arm and cameras on its head, it can basically take pictures of itself and then use the other camera to take a picture of what the scene would look like without the arm there. And so it looks like it's, it's taken a picture without the, the selfie stick in the way. But uh, of course, that's just a, essentially a trick of the way they put the pictures together. So it's... Uh, you know, some people have used this as, as evidence that, oh, yeah, this is just happening in a, in a studio somewhere. No, it's just happening with really good cameras and really smart people. Curiosity's got some footage of these dust devils, the storms that happen on Mars. You see these sometimes just here on Earth, and they're very, very minor. But on Mars, they can really turn into massive storms. And here we get to see one basically in stop motion. Uh, they were taking pictures of something else and just happened to catch this, this uh, dust devil as it went across the, the view. So that's kind of neat. These are the kinds of images that Perseverance is returning. Very, very high resolution. All of these layers of rock, these are laid down by water. There's, there's no doubt about it. And um, the view from Perseverance's or Percy's camera, Percy for short, is just stunning. The, the level of detail. You can pull these down from the internet and zoom in to the point where you're just looking at a, a tiny little fragment there and it still looks sharp and clear. The, the cameras on this thing is just, are just amazing. And so it's quite the, quite the spacecraft. Percy will dig down into the soil, looking for, you know, doing some analysis, looking for signs of water, signs of life and things like that. It's also gonna take some samples and put them away in little sample tubes and sort of hold on to them. Because here's the thing, we'd like to know, we'd like to be able to get some of these samples back to Earth. You know, you can only put so much science lab on a rocket and have it land on Mars. You really need scientists there to be able to look at these things in detail and, and do their, their research 
in person. And it's cheaper to go and get the rocks and bring them back than it is to actually send the scientists to Mars. So we're going to do that. Percy will collect the samples and then a future mission will land nearby and come and pick them up. And that one will put them in a little rocket and launch them back to Earth and bring them home. It's kind of an ambitious plan, but it is uh, one of the one of the only ways to get samples from Mars where you know exactly where the sample came from. Because, of course, Percy takes very careful notes of exactly where each rock sample comes from. Again, just some shots of, uh, there's that's the end of the arm with all sorts of, you know, bits of scientific equipment and so on. You can see the, la the layer of dust all over everything already. The winds of Mars kick up the dust pretty pretty quickly. And in fact, almost immediately on landing, Percy was somewhat covered with, with dust. These views are, they really make Mars look like a place. It's not, it's not a planet up there in the sky. It's not just a, a round thing that we see pictures of. It's a place you can, you can pretty much go there and explore it. And that's what Percy is doing right now. There are a couple of other active spacecraft. The Chinese, um, uh, orbiter and rover is still in orbit and th they're going to land their rover sometime in may although they don't tend to announce things in advance they tend to do it and then show us the pictures afterwards and the um uh, as mike pointed out in the chat there the uh united arab emirates has a spacecraft orbiting mars the al amal spacecraft which means hope is in orbit taking some great pictures and uh we've only seen a few of those as well but i assume that there'll be this big release of all sorts of things coming up here's the really exciting part that's that's coming up the ingenuity helicopter they stuck a tiny little drone on percy and it is in the process of lowering that drone down to the surface here's a picture the drone is the little square box with uh little legs going down to the left and then up those are basically it's a drone about this size it's got a couple of rotating propellers and they're going to try and fly it no earlier than april 8th but they have picked out where they're going to go and the idea is that you will get this helicopter flying all over the place going up getting those those amazing drone views from from above and so on engine or uh, Percy drops it off in the airfield, which is already, it's already there and it's in the process of putting it down and folding the legs down. In fact, I think the last legs came down today. And then Percy's going to back off so it can have a good view with the, with the cameras. Then they're going to try it. <coughs> Excuse me. I really hope it works. It might not. This is a total test. Um, the air on Mars is very thin. It's thinner than the air up you know, in the, in the high mountains and helicopters generally can't fly in the high mountains because there just isn't enough air for them. So this was designed as carefully as possible, but it still might not work. We'll have to see what happens, but <coughs> excuse me, we can watch for that sometime after April 8th. And they're going to be bringing all those pictures back really, really quickly. NASA is very good at, at the public relations game in making us all feel like we've sort of gone along with uh for the ride all right i think we have uh some time for questions if anyone has any questions you can pop them into the various chats um i haven't been able to see questions go by in the last uh five or so minutes mike how are you doing out there you got any questions uh things are pretty quiet out there in facebook and youtube land especially the youtubers they're being very quiet in their chat uh, but on Facebook, we do have a question. Terry uh, has been very curious. I saw him ask this question during the show, uh, and he's asked it again. He wants to know if we've collected any water from the surface or from Mars, I guess. Well, we haven't collected any because there is no water that is sort of easily collectible. Any of the water that we've found so far is either frozen into ice at the ice caps or is... Um, sort of locked into the into the rocks so you know there are there are rocks that have water molecules in them but it's sort of locked inside the rock so we haven't collected any yet we have detected the signs of it by the the various chemistry labs that they send along on the rovers and by studying the the different kinds of images and just by looking at the the effects that the the water has had 
in the past. Like you can see dried up lakes and riverbeds. And let me see, I think I have an image up here. Oh. Um, where basically some liquid was flowing and the only one that can really fill that role um, at the temperatures that we're talking about here is, is water. There, there has been a spacecraft that landed up near the uh, one of the polar ice caps, the Phoenix spacecraft, and we actually expect that it is in direct contact with water ice right now. Um, the polar ice cap expands and contracts over the winter, it expands, and then in the, over the summer it, it shrinks down. And Phoenix landed close enough that the ice probably um, basically moved right over top of it and froze it solid after its mission was over. So, I mean, we we uh that one wasn't designed to bring any samples back so we don't have that water but that's that's pretty much what happened to phoenix good question yeah and uh like i say if anybody has any other questions feel free to put them in the chat and i'll pass them along to scott but scott i do want to mention uh, there was a, a comment about the dust devil video and i think what i really liked about the dust devil video is it showed motion uh, that something's happening that, I mean, yes, Mars may be a dry, dead desert planet, uh, but there is there is atmosphere, so there is action taking place. And I think uh, a lot of our viewers uh, would find that exciting. Yeah, for sure. That We look at this kind of image and it's, it's a rocky, dry desert world, sand. Um, there are clouds, but these are like snapshots, right? When the, when the rover takes pictures, it's like you taking a, a, a picture with your phone. You capture a moment in time. If you want to be able to see things change, you have to sort of take pictures of the same area over and over. And what tends to happen is that the scientists are always moving the camera because they want to take pictures of a whole bunch of things. So it's kind of rare that we see this kind of footage where you can actually see that kind of motion. They, they, you kind of have to... They kind of have to plan for it, really. This this one was a little bit of a lucky kind of thing, but uh, it is rare to see this this kind of weather happen. Um, and I mean, you you compare this to some of the tornado videos you see on online of tornadoes and storms here on Earth. There's just not enough heat, not enough air on Mars to make that kind of of energetic storm. And yet, there's still these Martian dust storms that cover the whole planet. So you would think that there would be less intense weather on Mars because of the conditions. But in fact, in some ways there's more intense weather. It's, it's weather has always been a mystery. And so, I mean, it's, it's difficult to figure out the weather here on earth, let alone the weather on other planets. Yeah. The questions are starting to come in a little bit here, Scott, uh, related to the dust devils, uh, Michelle on Facebook is wondering, uh, was there any sound recorded from it and do they ever plan to record sound? Uh, on Mars or uh, does is anything make sound on Mars? Yeah, well, there would be definitely a sound. Um, the, the thin air would actually transmit sound very quickly. And so you wouldn't have as much of a delay as you have here on the, on the earth with, uh, with that kind of thing. But what's interesting is Perseverance has a microphone on it and it has recorded the sound of wind on Mars. They didn't record sound on this. This was a previous mission that didn't have a microphone, but um, Perseverance has recorded a number of different sounds on Mars. They're somewhat um, overshadowed by the noise of the rover itself. You know, you've, you've got a robot that's moving around and the wheels are going and, and stuff like that. So um, there's a lot of robot noises, but there's also the sound of the wind, which is kind of cool. And um, I think if there is, if there ever is a, a dust storm or, or that kind of weather event, uh, it would be really cool to hear, hear those sounds from Perseverance. All right, and we have a question from Hadley on Facebook. Uh, and uh, Hadley's asking, do we have any rocks or anything like that retrieved from Mars? Hey, Hadley, good question. Um, well, it turns out that we do, but not the way you would probably expect. You know, we're planning, Perseverance is going to take these samples and it's going to hold on to them and then a future rocket will land nearby and then somehow pick those up and pack them into another rocket which will launch back to the Earth and then we'll have Mars samples. Great. We already have Mars samples because a long time ago, Mars was hit by an asteroid or comet, some kind of object. Actually, it was hit by lots of them. In fact, everything in the solar system was hit by these things. We, we find craters all throughout the solar system. You see them on the moon, you see them on the Mars, even on even on Earth. 
Well, one of the impacts on Mars was big enough that the explosion actually blasted pieces of Mars out into space. And those little pieces of Mars became little planets going around the sun, essentially. And they went around the sun for who knows how long. Turns out that their orbit intersected the orbit of the Earth. And one day, this piece of Mars crashed into the Earth. And it came through the atmosphere like a meteor does and heated up and, you know, then survived all the way down to the ground and landed on the ground. And then who knows how much longer after that, it was found by someone and collected and then eventually identified. I think we have a, about a dozen examples of Martian meteorites here on the earth. And so they're kind of the, the cheap way of getting samples from space. You just sort of wait millions of years until a piece falls on your head kind of thing. But we do have a few of those samples and we've been able to sort of confirm that they're from Mars based on the composition of the rocks and the, the isotopes and the, of the elements and, and a bunch of things like that. So we know that they, they came from Mars and not the moon or an asteroid or, or whatever. But the thing about those is we don't know when they got here. We don't know where on Mars they came from. All we know is they came from Mars. And that's, that's kind of not enough to be able to draw any conclusions. They're great to have, but we, we really want to have rocks where we know exactly where they came from and exactly what the conditions are. You know, it's like, it's like um, provenance, essentially. You, you want to know where all of these samples come from so that you can see how they fit into the big, the big picture of things. Okay, I think we're quiet on questions for now, but I just uh, saw, Scott, I was doing a little quick little research and I see uh, an announcement from just a couple of hours ago that NASA has said that Ingenuity will not be uh, launched until no earlier than April 11th now. Uh, okay, that's good to know. Yeah, that's that's the kind of thing that they'll they'll slip until uh, they they are comfortable that everything will work properly. Um, you only have one go, and if something doesn't work, then uh, there's nobody that can pop over there and you know set the drone back on its on its legs or whatever. So, okay, that's good to know. Um, I also want to say for those of you that uh, were watching the show, definitely go back through the comments. Mike threw a whole bunch of really cool trivia, but also some great links in there about other aspects of Mars. It's uh, it's a really good way to sort of dive deep and, and learn more about the planet, uh, both historically and also the the cool missions and, and things like that. So there's a whole bunch of stuff in there that'll stay in the, in the comments here. So you can come back and do that at any point. So there'll be lots of, uh, lots of things that you can learn about Mars. And of course, if it is still clear, you can go outside and see Mars right now. It's in the West, um, up above the V shape of, up above the V shape of Taurus the bull here. Over here is the seven sisters, the, the Pleiades as it's called. And there's Mars right there. So go out, take a look at it, compare its color to the other nearby stars and uh, do your own Mars exploration. Okay, I think that about wraps it up for tonight. We'll be back next week with our, excuse me, with our regular Dome at Home programs, uh, hey, looking Scott, at the skies. Hey, oh, sorry, don't forget about our spring break challenge. <gasps> oh my gosh, you are absolutely yeah. right. Yes, the spring break challenge. We've been it's it's not really a surprise. We've been talking about this a number of uh, a number of weeks already. It started off just as a a cool let's let's throw this out and and give the kids something to do, and it turned into something that people have really embraced. So um, our spring break challenge is uh, let's explore Mars. And so you can download this sheet from the museum website, from the Dome at Home uh, page on, on the museum website. And basically the idea is we're asking people to design a spacecraft um, out of cardboard or paper or plastic, anything that isn't going to be dangerous, basically, that will allow an egg to survive a fall of about two meters. So six, six and a half feet. If you stand up on a chair and you drop an egg, it's going to hit the ground and it's going to go splat. Design a spacecraft that will save the egg. And you'll basically be going through the same kinds of processes that the engineers went through to design perseverance and ingenuity so that they could survive their high speed impact with Mars. 
basically they were coming in at, I don't know, 30,000 kilometers an hour or something like that. And they basically had to come down to zero kilometers per hour in only about seven minutes. So they had all sorts of things. There was a parachute involved. There were some rockets involved. You're probably not going to use rockets, but previous, uh, previous spacecraft have used airbags or balloons to help cushion the, uh, the um, impacts. There are all sorts of shock absorbers and things like that. There are a huge number of resources on the internet that'll get you started on this. If you look for egg, egg drop or egg lander, um, and there's a few links on our sheet as well that you can download from the Manitoba Museum website. Michael, pop that uh, link in the chat for you so that you can click right there. We'd love to see your videos. Um, either post them on social media with the hashtags that we have there or send us a, an email. You can send it to space at manitobamuseum.ca and that will uh, get to us. We're, uh, we're going to be showing some more videos uh, next week and putting some on our website and I'm, I'm working on some prizes for, uh, for some of the entries because some of the, some of the, some of the amount of effort I've seen going into some of these landers has been fantastic. And I, I really want to be able to reward and commend the, the people that are working on this. This is, this is what engineers do. Somebody gives you a problem and you have to figure it out and you might fail the first time. And then you do it again. And then you do it again and again until you get it right. That's that's the process of engineering. That's that's how science progresses essentially. So, it's a great activity. If you got uh, kids at home, or you got you know budding engineers, or if you're an adult, I would love to see somebody take an egg and uh, you know amp up the egg drop a little bit so maybe it can survive a, a a longer fall or something like that. I'm sure there's a bunch of ways to to uh, take on this challenge. Thank you, Mike. I, uh, I can't believe I almost forgot that after the uh, fuss we had to sort of get everything ready for people. But uh, it is it is going to be uh, a lot of fun. I've, I've loved watching, oops, I've loved watching all the videos that have come in so far. And uh, hopefully we'll get a few more in the next little while. So this is our, uh, now it is the end of the show. Uh, we would love to hear what you thought of the show. Feel free to fill out the survey. Actually, please fill out the survey that Mike has dropped in the in the comments, and that'll give uh, a sense of you know what you like about the show, what you'd like to see more of. We will see you next Thursday at seven o'clock with our regular Dome at Home programming. Mike and I will be back, and until then, clear skies, and I hope you get a chance to get out under the stars and explore the solar system. Have a great night.